So in city skylines, buildings just level up. People get richer and smarter, and everyone wins. It's not really how it works in real life. Today we're going to talk about gentrification. This is a hard topic to cover generically. Uh, gentrification happens in different ways, for different reasons, in different cities. Uh, this is intended to be a high-level overview that attempts to catch as much of the big picture as possible. I expect I won't be able to cover everything adequately in some future episodes. We'll go into some subjects in further detail. Uh, gentrification is characterized by an influx of new people into a neighborhood who have larger incomes than the people who already live in that neighborhood. This may happen for a variety of reasons. New amenities have popped up nearby, new transit may have been installed, making the neighborhood more convenient to jobs. Maybe someone instituted some kind of tax break in the neighborhood, or there was just some really effective marketing campaign. The reason doesn't matter that much, but the effects definitely do. So we're back at 52nd Street. We'll say the highway from the last episode never got built. Average rents in the area are about $600 per month per bedroom. So, for instance, a two-bedroom apartment goes for $1,200 a month or so, and a studio might go for $500. Rents are a little higher near the elevated rail station and a little lower near the freeway. So, the city that 52nd Street is located in recently won a competitive bidding process for the second headquarters of a big company with an illegal monopoly on online retail and it's bringing a lot of high paying jobs to the city. They're recruiting primarily young professionals both from area universities and from out of town and these people need a place to live. With that in mind, the city implements a generous rezoning of the 52nd Street corridor owing to its excellent transit connections and clear ability to support more density. But developers jump on the opportunity and the bulldozers are revved up. These are the lofts at 52nd Street. They're not actually lofts. Lofts are converted industrial spaces. This is new construction. A full block is demolished for this new building. Uh, what we lose are six small apartment buildings, 22 row houses, and this displaces 20 families and about 130 single people. The rent is about $800 a month for a studio, $1,200 a month for a one-bedroom, and $2,300 a month for two-bedroom units. There's no three-bedroom units. These are the Mews at Columbia Avenue. They're not actually Mews. Mews are converted stables. These are new construction. Replaces 14 row houses, displacing 12 families and 6 single people. There are urban mansions which are aimed at high-earning families who don't want to live in the suburbs. They want urban living. The prices start at $575,000 and up. These are the Savoy Apartments. They're not actually apartments, they're mostly condos. So it was originally a residential hotel or a single room occupancy building or SRO. There's 300 rooms starting at only 150 bucks a month. There's room for a twin bed, a sink, a fridge, a hot plate, the bathrooms down the hall. Uh, if you remember Elwood's apartment from the Blues Brothers, that's the sort of thing it is. If you're down on your luck, the Hotel Savoy was there for you, uh, keep you off the street. Uh, the renovation, of course, uh, results in 50 luxury condos and two townhouses starting at $250,000 plus condo fees. This building is Schenectady Square. It's not actually a square, it's an apartment tower. Replaced a parking lot so no one was displaced by this building. The rent's 1000 bucks a month for a one-bedroom. Uh, 1950 bucks for a two-bedroom, and there's no three-bedroom units. This is Mulberry House. It's not a house, it's an office tower. It's the headquarters for a consortium of left-leaning comedy podcast producers who have combined their Patreon income to reduce overhead. It replaces ten row houses, four small apartment buildings, which displaces seven families and 50 single people. 
Now, I only went into detail about a couple of cases here since this video is already running long, but we've displaced 39 families and near 500 single people just with these four buildings. Uh, I'm keeping families and single people separate here since moving a family is a lot tougher work than picking up your own single self and moving. The kids got to switch school districts and they got to make new friends in a new neighborhood. You got to move a lot more stuff, so on and so forth. Uh, most of those people's displaced will have received minimum notice from their landlords that they wouldn't be renewing their lease. That's usually 90 days. This leaves them with about three months to scramble to put together enough money for a security deposit plus first and last month's rent for an apartment or a house somewhere else. Of course, we hear the statistic all the time that most Americans can't cover a $400 expense and first and last and security deposit on an apartment or house that can fit a family of four could easily come out to $6,000 or more. Uh, this is a non-trivial expense for even an upper middle class family, let alone, you know, the working class folks who are most frequently displaced by new development. Most of these folks are going to have to move to much less desirable neighborhoods like inner ring suburbs with worse transit access. Uh, so displacement like this is extremely rough on renters, though it's an entirely an externality to the developers. Homeowners fare significantly better since they have a lot more control over whether or not they sell out, though cities exercising eminent domain to allow for private development isn't unknown, especially for big-ticket development. So the new housing that's built is primarily one- and two-bedroom apartments and condos, which are aimed at single young professionals and rent for nearly twice as much as the housing stock they replaced. They're not really suitable for raising a family in at all. Uh, and that's to say nothing of the Savoy Hotel, many of whose uh, former occupants are probably actually out on the street at this point. So the neighborhood changes fundamentally as gentrification and development occurs, and a lot of people get screwed over. Meanwhile, landlords of existing buildings start eyeing up these new buildings which are earning more rents, and start thinking, well, if they can charge twice what I can for a room, why can't I do the same thing? So absent any downward pressure on rents, which we'll talk about in a bit, the uh, rent for everyone starts creeping up and sometimes spikes sharply when an old tenant leaves or when a building is renovated. So what we just saw was a few ways new development might alter a community. Now I want to explain a few of the causes and effects so uh, bear with me while I make this logical leap and say that rents largely correlate with land value. As land value increases, rents increase and vice versa. I think this is a pretty reasonable assumption. Uh, now land value is affected by a lot of things. Speculation, of course, sometimes the quality of the school district, but most importantly proximity to high paying jobs. High earners are able to pay a premium to be close to work, obviously a much higher premium than low earners could pay, so uh, higher rents make sense. So developers tend to build near jobs or near transit stations that can get people to the jobs. Then the high earners move into the new or renovated apartments. And uh, as we saw, depending on how the development occurs, existing residents win or lose and they usually lose, especially if they rent. So how can we mitigate the effects of gentrification? There's a lot of competing solutions. Number one, build more housing. So if you took Econ 101, you know there's this thing called supply and demand, where as a supply of a commodity increases, the price decreases. So one theory on mitigating the effect of gentrification on rents is to increase the housing supply to the point where rents begin to stabilize or decrease. Now there are organized groups in many cities called the Yimbies for Yes in My Backyard who advocate for more housing. This is opposed to the Nimbies for Not in My Backyard who are usually individuals who oppose development. It, a NIMBYism is an organized movement. So depending on the city, these groups range from just a couple of urbanism geeks 
with no real influence over politics to uh, developer-fueled anti-tenant, anti-regulation advocacy groups. They vary widely in quality in that respect. I've found that generally East Coast YIMBY groups are a lot more friendly towards tenant rights than West Coast groups, for instance, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, YIMBY groups in general want to increase the housing supply to the extent that, in theory, housing prices go down. There are a couple problems with simply building your way out of gentrification, though. Luxury versus affordable housing. So, a common complaint about new construction is that it's all luxury construction. Uh, what, what is luxury? The marketing advertises granite countertops, hardwood flooring, maybe in-unit laundry or a doorman. But the thing is, everything has that now, except maybe the doorman. The difference between luxury and affordable housing is usually just the rent. Luxury is at best a marketing term for market rate. The rent is the thing. It's all about the rent. The rent is the difference between luxury and affordable. It's just the rent. It's the rent. So a developer can build a luxury building or an affordable building, right? but they're roughly the same building. The code requires rooms of a certain size with certain safety features. The construction has to be done in a certain way depending on the size of the building, so on and so forth. Some of the real high-end luxury buildings, you know, that's when you might start seeing much bigger apartments or bigger rooms or stuff, but your regular luxury building isn't that different from an affordable building. So the main difference there is return on investment. And given the choice between a luxury building with a high ROI or a nearly identical affordable building with a low ROI, guess which one the developer is going to pick? And even if the developer wants to build affordable housing, he's got to get that past the banks who are financing the thing and who also want the highest ROI because it's less risk for them to finance. Filtering. Some folks, especially the market urbanists, argue that building a lot of luxury housing is a good thing for rents. High earners will live in the luxury housing instead of snapping up older and lower quality housing. As the luxury housing ages, it'll filter down to become affordable for the regular folks. Now, if this sounds like trickle-down economics, it's because it is. Filtering, at best, has us wait 20 years to get affordable housing. And uh, a lot of these new buildings might not last 20 years, but that's another episode. Uh, meanwhile, while the petty bourgeois live in new luxury housing, the rest of us live in older, lower quality housing with the roaches and the doors that don't shut properly and the rotten floorboards. That's called compassion for the lower classes. The other problem with this theory is the precarity of these older, cheaper to live in buildings which leads us to displacement due to construction. Especially in denser neighborhoods, there's not much land to build new buildings without first kicking people out of occupied buildings. So in the course of gentrification, existing residents are given the boot so that new, hip, trendy young people with money can move in. This also applies to building renovations, of course. Tenants can be kicked out of their cheap apartments so they can be renovated into expensive apartments. The filtering process doesn't really account for these effects. This, I think, is the biggest problem with trying to build your way out of gentrification. In the short term, it causes, very directly, the exact problem you're trying to prevent, which is displacement of existing residents. The cure is indistinguishable from the disease. Uh, another problem, of course, leads us back to land value. I've never seen an apartment building which is worth less than a single-family house on the same lot. You can argue cause and effect a lot here, but land value tends to be higher where the denser development is, and that correlates with higher rents. I mean, Manhattan and Hong Kong both have a lot of housing, but that doesn't mean rent is going down. Number two, anti-gentrification policies. 
Anti-gentrification is a term I'm using to lump in a whole bunch of disparate groups whose main thing in common is that they are against gentrification and they aren't YIMBYs. So our other option is to try and take gentrification head on and prevent the new and expensive development from happening or at least controlling it. This has its own set of problems. This is usually done through down zoning. So a common method of combating development is down zoning broad swaths of a neighborhood to prevent new and expensive apartment buildings from being built. So think of it like rezoning an area from high density to low density. So I live in a neighborhood in Philadelphia called Spruce Hill where this happened years ago. Most of the houses are big rambling Victorians and ornate row houses which have been subdivided into three or more apartments. However, the existing zoning overlay prohibits new similar conversions from occurring. You can't turn a single family house into a three unit apartment building. Now this allows for community control of development. Apartment conversions are allowed but they have to be expressly approved by the registered community organization in the, na in the neighborhood and public hearings have to be held. The uh, RCO has the final say in pretty much all development which isn't by right or uh, explicitly allowed by the zoning and the zoning code is deliberately made pretty restrictive in what can happen by right. Uh, in Spruce Hill particularly it also acts as a sort of bad substitute for a historic district since Philadelphia's historic preservation laws are some of the most ineffectual in the country but uh, that's another episode. The problem here is that down zoning only serves to stave off the problem of rising rents. High earners still want to move into the neighborhood and are willing to pay a premium to do so, so rents still rise while new construction is limited. The community may have more control over the rate at which the rent rises, but the problem still exists. These zoning restrictions also typically don't cover renovations and alterations which preserve the same number of units or even reduce the amount of units so landlords can still renovate cheap apartments into expensive ones and kick out existing residents. Another method which is frequently employed by anti-gentrification advocates is opposition to improvements in the public realm that increase a neighborhood's access to uh, wealthier areas or to higher earning jobs or something like that. This can mean stuff like opposing bike lanes, transit improvements, even little things like sidewalk improvements. This is an unfortunate reflection of the structure of the housing market. If you improve access to high paying jobs in the neighborhood, it's unlikely that the existing residents will get those jobs, instead being forced out by new high earning residents. Therefore, improvements that might increase mobility uh, are usually opposed by anti-gentrification advocates. So, if building more housing leads directly to displacement and down zoning only serves to stave off the problem and is sometimes completely ineffective, how do you combat gentrification? Fundamentally pro-development YIMBYs and anti-gentrification activists are seeing two separate problems. YIMBYs ask how can we fit everyone in while the anti-gentrification activists are asking how can we keep everyone already there in their houses. And I'm not going to say that the truth is in the middle. This isn't a South Park episode. There's a pressing and urgent need for more housing in many cities but those same cities are also facing eviction crises and mass displacement owing to the construction of that same badly needed housing. Those displaced have no access to the housing when it's finished owing to its high price. So what's to be done? Number three, decommodification of housing. Decommodification is exactly what it sounds like. You make housing into not a commodity. Now socialists talk a lot about decommodification of housing and the knee-jerk reaction from critics is usually something patronizing like, well, anything's possible after the revolution, right comrade? I mean, sure, if we proceed in the Maoist way.
but I think most leftists don't really want to kill anyone to get a cheaper apartment, let alone engage in mass killings. Uh, decommodification, especially under capitalism, is going to be a long process of chipping away at the power of landlords. You can't just pass a law that says, well, housing is decommodified now, guys. But uh, anything that reduces the ability of landlords to extract rents from tenants or otherwise reduces their power over them is decommodification. Anything that provides decent housing at a lower price than the market can is helping with decommodification. Even policies that help homeowners, like affordable foreclosure insurance to help uh, people who are underwater on their mortgage, are in the service of the decommodification cause. Uh, here's a couple of examples of policies that can help in this process. Cooperative ownership of apartment buildings. Rent control. Guaranteed legal counsel in tenant landlord court. Improved and expanded tenant rights. Community land trusts. Rent control. Expanded availability of high quality public housing. Right of first refusal laws. Vacancy taxes. Rent control. Tenants unions. Good cause eviction laws. Stricter licensing requirements for landlords and stiffer penalties for failing to keep apartments in good condition. Rent control. Most of these policies are self-explanatory, but I'll go over a few here. Uh, cooperative ownership of apartment buildings. Plenty of these exist already, uh, but they're mainly reserved for the relatively well-off. A co-op board elected by the tenants oversees the building and makes decisions about maintenance and finance. Encouraging co-op buildings would go a long way to breaking the power of landlords. Right of first refusal laws. This is one of my favorite policies, actually, and it's already on the books in Washington, D.C. is the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, or TOPA. Right of first refusal here means that if an owner sells an apartment building, the tenants of that apartment building have the right to form a tenant association and purchase the building from the landlord rather than the person he's trying to sell it to. Now, in Washington, this is usually required the tenants to partner with another developer to finance the purchase of the building, but it's given tenants much more leverage to either stay in their apartments or receive a hefty buyout to get them to leave. Uh, coincidentally, part of Jeremy Corbyn's platform is uh, right of first refusal laws for factories and businesses which are shutting down, giving the employees the right to purchase the factory and equipment and reopen as a worker co-op. This would be funded by a national bank to loan workers the money. Uh, a similar bank could presumably be open to fund apartment building purchases by tenants. Uh, vacancy taxes. So if an uh, apartment or condo is vacant, you have to pay an extra tax on it. If an apartment or condo is a pied de terre or is otherwise usually unoccupied, you also have to pay an extra tax on it. That's simple. Community land trusts. These are civic organizations which own and manage land and buildings in a community, and they're organized by members of that community. They keep rent just high enough to function, but lower than a for-profit entity would. Um, expanded high-quality public housing. So you'd want to make public housing uh, cheaper than the market rate, and you want to open it to everyone, not just poor people, right? You have to build a lot of it, and you have to make it convenient to jobs via heavy rail rapid transit. You want it to be as appealing, if not more appealing, than the uh, private sector alternatives. Good cause eviction laws. These are laws that impose major restrictions on what can result in a tenant's eviction. Rent control, which limits rent increases per year to reasonable levels or stops them entirely sometimes. The overall effect of policies aimed at decommodifying housing, of course, is to make it harder to profit off of housing. You would curb speculation and reduce or eliminate profits possible from rent seeking. Effectively, the goal is to make housing useless as an investment and therefore useful only to put people in. Now, obviously, this makes it less financially viable for the private sector to build housing, 
since the profits from speculation and rent-seeking would disappear or be significantly reduced, but it wouldn't make it completely impossible. The value of housing would simply be based on its usefulness as a house rather than as an investment vehicle. Now, all the policies I've mentioned above already exist in one way or another in at least one or two cities. Full housing decommodification would have to go further, and I'm not exactly sure exactly what it would look like, or if it's even possible under a capitalist system. And at any rate, it might have ugly ramifications for our economy. Plenty of people's retirement savings are tied up in their own house's value, for instance, and huge parts of our economy are based on appreciation of real estate. Policies which decommodify housing do run the risk of hurting the economy as we know it uh, pretty significantly. But uh, to live in a world without landlords, evictions, or gentrification, it's a risk we'll eventually have to take. Okay, quick commercial here at the end of the video. If you like the video, go to my Patreon and give me a dollar. You'll be getting bonus episodes for giving me a dollar pretty soon. If you don't want to support me monthly, there's a buy me a coffee link in the description. Though I'm going to spend that on beer, not on coffee. Uh, follow me on Twitter at do not eat one or on Macedon, the new social network without neo Nazis, at do not eat at macedon.social. Uh, see you all in the next video.